Hello, welcome back to Charis for another raucous end of month book review video. Uh, in this fine month of May, I have read four books. I'm going to start by talking about a book that I didn't actually read though, just because it's really nice. Um, this is Ponty by Charlene Teo. I went to a pop-up event for Penguin Books in Shoreditch, uh, I guess last month, uh, and it was about feminism in the classics. Um, and Charlene was one of the authors that was speaking there and she was really eloquent and it sounded like the book, her like, debut novel, was really interesting. Um, it's about two women in Singapore um, who like are friends and one of them is kind of obsessed with the other one's dead mother who was a movie star. Um, anyway, so I actually only read 95 pages of this and then I stopped and that is because I was on holiday with people that didn't read and you know when you just kind of like don't read it enough and then you get like 100 pages in you're like I don't really remember the context of the things it's not really worth it so I decided to just put it down completely for now and pick it up another time but isn't this just the most gorgeous book cover you've ever seen like I'm obsessed with it it's so beautiful and I saw the um the cover of it in hardback and just like I wouldn't have bought it if it was in hardback sorry uh but this I oh, Okay, onto books I actually have read. Uh, the first is Flights by Olga Tokarczuk. I should have looked up how to pronounce that. Um, it's Polish. And uh, yeah, I read this mostly on my Kindle. And then, like, I read the last third on the new, well, it's not that new anymore, it's just the first time I've used it, uh, Audible Narration on Kindle. So on your Kindle app on your phone, you can listen to the audiobook and it kind of like highlights the lines and goes through it so you can see it on a page as well. And I've always loved doing that. I've loved like listening to audiobook while also reading the book because you can go faster with the audiobook, but then still get the context of the page, which I love. So would highly recommend that. I read Flights for a book club and um, during the book club, I found out loads of really cool things. So Flights was won the uh, International Man Booker in 2018. It was published in 2017, but it was actually published in 2007 in its native Polish. Um, and the translator, Jennifer Croft, spent 10 years like going around America I think um, and had like translated different sections of it and would do readings for it because she really wanted someone to pick it up and for her to translate the full thing um, and I'm glad she did because it was a phenomenal really well translated I mean you can't really say that from the position of like only having read the translation um, but I really I, I, I felt like I got the sense of what it was in Polish. The language was gorgeous, it was really really well written, which must mean it was well translated. So Flights is a fragmentary novel, it's in loads of different chunks, it kind of jumps through time, sometimes it comes back to the same story, sometimes it doesn't. It has elements of biography, um, autobiography in there, um, and it's just kind of like an odd rumination on like travel and travel now versus travel in the past and people's connections to place and bodies there's a lot of like biological stuff in there as well um really just like very odd and you kind of got the sense that the author was there were there, there were a few sections of um first hand uh bits where that she would talk about like the author would talk as if i, I don't know if this is just the actual author or like the character that the or the, the narrator was being um but would be like on trains and talking there's a lovely bit near the end where she was talking about writing about a man that she saw and he was writing and she was imagining that he was writing about her and they were writing about each other just looking at each other and how maybe everybody in the whole room was actually just writing about everyone else in the whole room i'm going to read you a section that i highlighted on my kindle uh, during one of these narrator centric parts they weren't real travellers, they left in order to return, and they were relieved when they got back, with a sense of having fulfilled an obligation. They returned to collect the letters and bills that stacked up on the chest of drawers, to do a big wash, to bore their friends to death by showing pictures as everyone attempted to conceal their yawns. This is us in Carcassonne, here's my wife with the Acropolis in the background. Then they would lead a settled life for the next year, going back every morning to the same thing that they had left in the evening, their clothes permeated by the scent of their own flat, their feet tirelessly wearing down a path in the carpet. That life was not for me. Clearly I do not inherit whatever gene it is that makes it so that when you linger in a place you start to put down roots. I've tried a number of times, but my roots have always been shallow. The littlest breeze could blow me right over. I just, I like, was only supposed to read the first section of that, and I just want to like, keep reading it out because it's so wonderful. Weirdly, one of my favourite sections of it, I think there are like, maybe four of these, uh, and they were Josephina Solomon's letters to Franz I, Emperor of Austria, and it was this woman writing, I think it was the 1700s? 
or something like that. Uh, and she was writing to this emperor because her father was in the in this emperor's court um, and had died there. And because he was black, he was going to be stuffed and been on display in this emperor's court. And this is the daughter writing like, please, 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 can you send our father's body back to us? Um, and it was just, it was like weirdly moving. There were so many just like clever, interesting things to think about. I'm very much like the person the narrator described in that thing I just quoted out to you. I love, I love to travel, but you know, I do come home for a big wash. But I feel like if you are a nomad in heart and spirit, um, you know, you'd really enjoy this book. So would recommend it a lot. The next book I have is also for a book club. I need to, I think, narrow down my book clubs to once a month because this is distressing. But uh, that is The Secret Barrister, Stories of the Law and How It's Broken. Uh, so this has an anonymous author. I really felt like it was a man as I was going through it. But having spoken to two lawyers now, apparently like on the scene, it's thought of that it's a woman, which is surprising to me. This was published in 2018 uh, and just came out in paperback, which is why we decided to do it. Uh, well, it's why I decided to suggest we do it. Um, and it's very like England and Wales centric. Uh, it's literally about the, the criminal justice system in England and Wales. Um, so if you're international, that's, that's not gonna be interesting at all to you. It will be interesting, but it won't be useful information. Um, it's basically about like, the whole way our criminal justice system is set up and how it's fucked <laughs> like the first the introduction was basically said what i said and i was like oh this is going to be one of those people that just have like a lot of hubris and a kind of like there's even a bit where where they're like um i guess i should say she where she well they where they're like um you know i'm i've been working in this this industry for the better part of a decade and I wanted to write this book now before I kind of like got sucked into it or stopped being outraged by it um but I kind of read that as in like oh it's just this young person that actually doesn't really understand that the things are set up the way they're supposed to and they just come in with all these fresh ideas um and that's what I thought like 20 pages into it and then by the end I was like so sold on this book <laughs> I'm so sold on it I'm not gonna go into too much detail I'm not actually going to go into any detail. Essentially, our criminal justice system, we have like a two tier uh, system. So we have the magistrate's court and the crown court. Um, and we use adversarialism as in like we have jury trials where um, the prosecution and the defense both present their like a fighting for their corner instead of uh, like a lot of European systems where it's inquisitorial. So it's all handled by the, the, the state and they basically have to like find out what the thing is. I explain that terribly, but it kind of goes through every decision we have in terms of the setup and like historical setup of the court system and how it's actually comparing, compared to most alternatives, it, it is the best way we found to do justice. Um, but through like horrendous underfunding in the past 20 years, the, it's it's so ineffectual now like it doesn't uh like it's it's set up really well but only if you know people have the resources they need to carry out the justice in the way that we set it out it really seems like 20 years ago you would have been guaranteed a fair trial and now you just like not they, there are so many examples in here of ways which it just completely broke down through lack of funding and i'm not some like radical lefty at all um but I do think that out of any publicly funded service, um, it's the, the first port of call in our social contract with the government is providing a reliable and trustworthy justice system, as reliable and trustworthy as it can be, uh, because it has the power to take away people's liberty and it's not doing it well. I am genuinely terrified of being involved in any sort of crime, any sort of criminal anything now from any side because I just don't think I would get the justice I deserve. So here's one thing, I do vaguely remember this being in the news a few years ago, but he goes into it in, in this book called The uh, Innocence Tax. So essentially, uh, if you have been accused of a crime, uh, you should get legal aid for you to pay, the lawyer should be paid for you to defend that crime, right? Uh, and historically, it had been that you can get, like anyone can get legal aid, but if you wanted to pay more for lawyers, for like your own private lawyers, uh, you can do that. And essentially that money would be, if you were proven not guilty, that money would be refunded to you. 
and to so that you'd be able to pay the lawyer. So it wouldn't cost you any money, basically, if you were accused of something. But now legal aid is only available to people that have a household income of less than £35,000, uh, which is like not poverty, but it's also like you can be just like a, a normal middle income household and still not be able to afford hundreds of thousands of pounds of private legal fees. But here's the kicker is that now if you get if you get acquitted of the crime, you will not like you don't get refunded the cost of the whatever lawyers you've you've paid for. You get like refunded the cost of what the the equivalent amount of legal aid would be. And obviously like going private without legal aid is so much more. So you can spend three hundred thousand pounds on lawyers to defend the fact that you've been ac accused of murder and then be acquitted and then only get like 50 grand back so you have to pay money even if you're innocent and it's like so fucked <laughs> there was one statistic in here that really hammered it home uh and i can't find it right now it was just a throwaway at the end of a chapter of the fact that um cutting legal aid cost us as a country i think it was like 275 billion pounds a year but we also like removed like took 1p off some sort of beer tax that like cost the country 300 million pounds a year so that's just the kind of em emphasis and importance we put on the criminal justice system in this country which is just crazy they talk a lot about how the nhs and the police are in the news all the time through their budget cuts but like no one wants to do that about the criminal justice system because everyone's like oh well who cares if we're cutting money to like you know, thieves and murderers, they don't need like fancier food in their jails and stuff. But it is literally like, it is money that goes towards that is the money that keeps you at liberty. It means that you can trust the state to prosecute and defend you as well as you would want to be. Oh my gosh, Ooh, very riled up. If you are a citizen of England or Wales and you want to know more about how any kind of public law system works, like you should read this book. It is so good. The next book I read as an audiobook was Unnatural Causes by Richard Shepard. Richard Shepard is slash was a forensic pathologist. So he did postmortems on the victims or perpetrators of crimes. Um, and it was kind of a memoir of his, his life doing this and how it, he kind of got led down this path and some of the big interesting cases he was involved in. I feel like I've read quite a few of these kind of medical memoir books recently and I feel like they're always sort of split into the two categories of like this is what happened with my life because they kind of start when they start the choice into this path like to study medicine or whatever um so there's that kind of aspect and like you know breakdown of marriages and the career progression stuff and then there is like the hardcore this is what I'm doing with my days um and I liked both of these aspects differently. So he was involved in some of the most serious disasters that we've had in this country for the past, you know, 30 years or so. The first big disaster he was involved in was the Hungerford Massacre in 1987, I want to say, um, which was a like mass shooting uh, and suicide. And, um, and but he's also been involved in like train crashes, uh, boats sinking, 9-11, uh, 7-7, a variety of like large scale disasters and he helped come up with the plan for the disaster response when these kind of things happen and yeah it was really interesting to hear about it from that perspective because I kind of imagined when like terrible like terrorist things happen or just big disasters like trains crashing you kind of imagine the medical side of things in terms of like the emergency care and getting ambulances to hospitals and having maybe like having them distributed in hospitals is like the biggest logistical thing you think about um but like uh, his work is just identifying bodies as fast and as accurately as possible so that you know people can know what's happening and that, like why so he had this thing where uh, in one disaster they um they were told not to do full post-mortems because it's like obvious what the the cause of death was but then afterwards he was told off for not doing them fully because he wanted to uh, be able to provide the family's closure as quickly as possible so he had to kind of establish a protocol for what happens in these situations and it's now like you do do full post-mortems like in any sort of suspicious circumstance you can rule, rule out anything else and you know not leave any stone unturned on the other side of it in terms of how his life progressed 
um, it was really interesting. It kind of felt like it took a turn in the last few chapters um, where he started talking about how he has like severe PTSD from all of these horrific incidents that he's been involved in and uh, how it kind of like came out of nowhere and then was completely debilitating as you'd expect it would be if you've had memories of so many dead bodies. I just read like a headline article of he's done like over 23,000 post-mortems and that's a lot of well like death to witness on a slab but also being involved in these like very frantic and um, very urgent disaster situations and just seeing like the worst that humankind has to offer. So it was definitely interesting him talking about how he dealt with that and how he kind of struggled with it and like didn't talk to anybody and went into a dark hole and like through therapy has has like worked through a lot of those issues. Um, that was really interesting. Another thing that kind of ties into the secret barrister is that uh, he used to be and most pathologists um, used to be kind of salaried by university so he would do like talks and lecture in a university and that would pay his income and then he would essentially do the post-mortems on behalf of the state for free because he's being like paid for by the university uh, but then over the past like 20 years uh, universities have have not wanted to offer offer pathology in their degrees in medicine uh, because like there's so many different parts of medicine I don't know it's basically like gone out of favor so now they're no longer um, employed by universities so they're like freelance well <laughs> let me do a freelance post-mortem um, but they're all self-employed now so they have to deal with all that bollocks and that's something that's like heavily gotten into in the secret barrister because criminal barristers paid absolutely nothing like 18 grand for the first 10 years or something just ridiculous I don't know why any like he talks a lot about sorry she talks they talk a lot about how um, you as a lawyer are really discouraged from going into the criminal justice system because they're all self-employed and it's a system that allows for basically like bad people most people that do it are really good because they want to and they wouldn't do it for that price anyway uh, but there's a lot of kind of like underhanded we'll take these kind of cases, not these kind of, like, anyway, Unnatural Causes. It was good, but I have read better medical biographies, um, something like When Breath Becomes Air, or like Do No Harm, uh, even like the one I talked about the other month with The End of Mind by Catherine Mannix, I feel like they were more sort of writerly. This is an interesting field. Maybe I've just read too many of these by now. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was good if you, like that and let's have a slightly morbid nature. And now we come to my last book of this month. This is Normal People by Sally Rooney. Who hasn't read this book yet? Um, I decided to wait for it to come out on paperback because I'm just like that. I actually, in January, I went through all of the books in my wish list that were gonna come out in paperback over the next six months and just pre-ordered all of them. So I'm like, this Secret Barrister, uh, I think there's the only one left is Motherhood by Sheila Hattish. Uh, anyway, that's gonna arrive next week sometime, but yeah, all about the paperbacks. <laughs> but it does mean I'm really behind on this. So, Sally Rooney, uh, her first book was Conversations with Friends that came out in, I wanna say 2016 to like, great aplomb, maybe 2017 even. Um, and this is a highly anticipated second novel. I haven't read Conversations with Friends, and that's because my boyfriend went to university with Sally Rooney, they were both part of this debating society, and although they're a few years apart, like, and I, the, the book club that I'm part of that was doing flights is full of, it's literally all debating society people from Trinity. Um, so they all kind of like know of or know Sally Rooney and have a lot of kind of like stories and they're all gossiping about, you know, which character is which person in her life. And I feel like I kind of had, I was a bit tainted by that and I wanted to like m more time to pass between me like learning a lot of that kind of information and actually like reading the book so I could be slightly more objective about it. Um, it is still like slightly tainted <laughs> because I'm just aware of how much this is sort of like her life. Um, but you know, you know, it was a really, it was a good book. I, I enjoyed it a lot. It, it wasn't like phenomenal to me, um, but I did like it a lot. So this follows uh, two young people, Connell and Marianne, uh, when they're in their last year of school in a fictional town near Sligo in West Ireland. Marianne's like a book nerd that has like no friends but doesn't really care and Connor is like a jock who's like actually quite shy but is really popular and they kind of like start bumping uglies but he doesn't want her to tell anyone like it has to be a secret because of you know his social status or whatever. Um, and then they end up both going to Trinity uh, in Dublin and 
they it this it jumps a few months at a time so you kind of get it over a sort of I think it's a four or five year period um, and how they're sort of just their lives are really intertwined and it takes a while for them to realize that they are like cosmically <laughs> intertwined like they wouldn't be able to get rid of each other but they're also never never like together most most of the book they each have different girlfriends and boyfriends so this book is all about just their relationship and try to how they try and figure it out over time because Marianne will do anything for Connor and Connor knows that and it kind of scares him and they're always kind of dancing around each other and it sometimes it really frustrated me uh, but I really it did feel very real and I know that's what that's what all of the reviews are for this is like the whole point of the book is that it's just about like two people's relationships and how they can bring all this baggage and then develop baggage between them and then but still have something. Yes, I liked it a lot and I'm looking forward to reading Conversations with Friends. Again, I feel like I need to do the distance between this and that. Oh, this is tiring. Um, but yeah, I really, I love the writing. I actually really love the writing. I loved how it would, um, first you did that thing where you don't use quotation marks and sometimes I think that's like a bit trite and I kind of feel like in a contemporary novel it is a bit trite, um, but it works here. And there's a lot of just kind of like jumping through time during telling a story. It's like, you know, at his house and then it goes to like, oh yeah, and a week ago this happened, then it like comes back to there really seamlessly. I think the passage through time and like the way that time and place is dealt with is really subtle and really good. Anyway, so that's my completely professional review of Normal People by Sally Rooney. Fuck, it's hot. It's like 24 degrees today and I've had to close the window. Bullshit. That was a lot of unnecessary swearing and I apologise to my younger viewers. I will see you in June for more literary delight and I hope you have a wonderful day. Goodbye.